If those words are ever going through your heart, what is better for me? They can actually keep you, and I'm going to show you in this course, they can actually keep you from experiencing the intimacy that you want from God and the blessing that you want from God. Hey everybody, welcome to lesson three of Drawing Near a Life of Intimacy with God. This lesson is titled Passion for His Presence. Now in over 40 years of ministry, I have observed two major groups of Christians inside the church. Two major groups. Group number one, those who seek God for what He can do for them. Group number two, those who seek God because of who He is. All right, this contrast is seen so beautifully between Israel and Moses. Now let's set this up. As I said in an earlier lesson, Moses sees the burning bush. God then says to Moses in the process, I have called you to be the deliverer of Israel. Now you have to realize they have been in captivity for 430 years. I mean, they have been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for God to deliver them and give them the land of milk and honey that was promised to their forefather, Abraham. God had Abraham walk that land hundreds of years earlier, said, I will give this to your descendants, but they will be strangers in a foreign land for over 400 years and they will be oppressed for that 400 years. God says to Moses, I am about to deliver Israel and you are going to be the deliverer. Wow, 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 wow. So Moses gets his wife and children. They head out to Egypt. When they get to Egypt, they first go to Goshen. Goshen is where the children of Israel were staying. It was like the slum part of Egypt at that time because the Egyptians had brutally oppressed the children of Israel. They had stripes on their backs. They were working all their lives to build somebody else's inheritance. They're eating the worst foods in the land. But Moses goes to the elders of Israel before he goes to Pharaoh. And Moses tells the elders of Israel, God has appeared to me and God has told me that it is time for Israel to be set free from Egypt and he has sent me to be the deliverer. I was trained as a prince of Egypt. I know how to lead. We are going out and God is going to do it. Now, I want you to just think about this. Here are these elders in this room. What their, what their grandfather shared with them and never saw, what their father shared with them, but yet he lived and died and never saw what their great-grandfather shared with them, and yet he lived and died and never saw. They were now beholding the promised deliverer. Can you imagine the mood of this room? Well, let me read it to you. They were soon convinced the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron because of the signs that they did. And when they realized, this is the elders of Israel, when they realized that the Lord had seen their misery and was deeply concerned for them, they bowed their heads and worshiped. This is Exodus 4, verse 31. They are worshiping God. Oh my gosh, they're overwhelmed with emotion, tears. They're laughing, they're crying, they're jumping up and down. Man, what my grandfather longed for but died and never saw, I'm actually going to walk in it. Well, Moses leaves the presence of these elders and goes straight into Pharaoh's court and brings the exact same message to Pharaoh. What is Pharaoh's response? Ha! Huh. He mocks Moses and God and Pharaoh says, oh, so they're too idle? They don't have enough to do? And he increases their hardship. Now, let me, let me explain something. They had a quota of bricks that they had to make for Pharaoh's cities that he was building, right? Every single day. And what was supplied to them every day was the straw and the supplies that they needed to make the bricks. Pharaoh said, ah, oh, you guys are so idle. You don't have enough to do. Now you're going to have to go out and get your own straw. We're not going to provide it for you anymore. Now, let, let's, just, let's just paint this picture. Typical day for an, for an Israelite was they got up at sunrise, threw something down their mouth to eat, go out to the brick pits and work until sunset. Then they come home, try to eat something, exhausted, collapse, only to get up and do the same thing the next day. 
Now things have changed. They have to get up about an hour before sunrise and go get the straw so they can make the bricks because if they don't make the same quota of bricks, they're gonna have more whips on their back. Oh my gosh. Moses bringing the word of God to Pharaoh increased their hardship and their misery. And so do you know what these same elders do? They call judgment upon Moses. They say, may God judge between you and us for what you've done by bringing this increased hardship on our life. That's Exodus 5.21. Well, after 10 plagues, God finally convinces Pharaoh to let his people go. Well, actually, he had hardened Pharaoh's heart because he wanted to show his glory to e Egypt and to the children of Israel. Pharaoh says, you're going. And when Pharaoh says, you're going, they have a massive, these ch same guys, okay, that were calling judgment on Moses a few chapters earlier, they're having a massive celebration. The Egyptians are giving them their gold and silver. There's not one feeble one. They're dancing out of Egypt. Now what happens next? Moses leads them by the Spirit of God right up to the border of the Red Sea. They turn around and realize Pharaoh has amassed his chariots. Now, you got to understand, that's like tanks today, M1 tanks, okay? He's amassed his chariots, his hordes of chariots, and they are marching on Israel, and they're going to butcher them, right? So now, what's going on? This is what the people said, Exodus 14, verses 11 and 12. Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in this wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? This is what we said to you back when we called judgment on you. Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it, Now listen to this. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in this wilderness. Listen to those words. It would have been better for us. So this is the motivation for Israel. What's better for me? Okay, are you getting this? I'll talk about it in a moment. All right. So God's merciful. What does he do? He splits the Red Sea. They walk across on dry ground only to get to the other side. And they look back. And they see Pharaoh and his armies all buried underneath the Red Sea. They're literally watching chariots coming, washing, and bodies washing up on the shores. And now what happens? The entire nation goes into a jubilant celebration. And they sing a song, the Song of Moses. And then Miriam grabs every woman. Can you imagine about 800,000 women going out into the, this, this wide open expanse? And they're all dancing with the tam tambourines. And they're singing, I will sing unto the Lord. He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. They are just rejoicing, right? Okay, what happens next? Three more days. Okay, they, they, now, now, now stop and think about this. All of them are thinking, why did we ever doubt God? We just literally watched the Red Sea buried our oppressors for 400 years. How could we ever have doubted him? But if we go three more days after that, there's not enough food, there's not enough water. And now what are they saying? Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. This is Exodus 16, 3. When we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full for you, speaking of Moses, have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So now do you see the pattern? All right, what's the pattern here? They are happy as long as God is doing what they want when they want it. And they are unhappy when God is not doing what they want when they want it. The whole basis of their belief in God, of their following God, is what is better for me. Because you will see this constantly in the book of Exodus. They are constantly saying, it was better for us, it was better for us, it was better for us. If those words are ever going through your heart, what is better for me? They can actually keep you, and I'm gonna show you in this course, they can actually keep you from experiencing the intimacy that you want from God and the blessing that you want from God. Now, let's contrast them with Moses. What do we read about Moses? Hebrews eleven twenty four 24 through 26. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose, listen to these words, he chose to share in the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ 
than to own the treasures of Egypt. For, now listen to this. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. Now, the question we have to ask is what is the great reward? Okay, and, and secondly, he chose to suffer. Israel didn't choose. Israel would just, they, 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 they suffered not choosing it, but yet Moses chose it, okay? Because he chose this suffering, and he's not a masochist. He's not looking for suffering. He's choosing a road that leads to the great reward, and that road happens to have suffering in it. Okay, a religious person will go out and try to suffer to earn favor with God. That's religion. Don't ever do that. A true believer will follow God's ways, but in that ways, because we live in an opposing world, we'll, we'll enter suffering, persecution. Okay? Now, the question we have to ask is, what is the great reward that he's chasing after? Well, we find it in Exodus 33. So the Lord comes to Moses in Exodus 33. He says, hey, go ahead and get going. Go on down there, get the people, gather them up, and I want you to go to the land that flows with milk and honey. The land that I promised Abraham hundreds of years ago, the land that is a delightful land, I want you to gather the people, I want you to go, and I'm gonna send a choice angel with you, and that angel is gonna drive out all the enemies, all the ites, they call them ites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, all that stuff, right? It's gonna drive out all the ites, but listen to what God said, but I will not travel among you. Oh, wait a minute here. So God is saying, Moses, Go down, get Israel, go to the promised land. I'm sending an angel, but I'm not going. Now, I'm glad God didn't say this to Israel because if Israel would have taken Egypt without God, I'm sure they would have taken the promised land with a choice angel. They would have had a party and gone. But do you want to hear what Moses said? Moses said in verse 15, then Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Now stop a minute and think, where is here? Here's the place of suffering. It's the desert. Do you understand? I, 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 I want you to think this through, okay? A desert is not a fun place to be. You know, we always boast about the fact that God gave him manna, but can you imagine eating bread every single day for a year? No peanut butter, no jelly, no meat, okay, no, no, no desserts, no, no, nothing, just bread. Can you imagine having no valleys, no streams, no lakes, no shopping malls? Yeah, you're wearing the same clothes that you came out of Egypt with a year ago, but it's the only outfit you own. Can you imagine how absolutely dull that would get? Moses said, I would rather be under these conditions with your presence than go to your promised land without your presence. So in essence, what he is declaring is, I would rather have your presence. If I have to choose, I would rather have your presence than your promises without your presence. So I'm going to say it again clearly. I would rather have your presence without your promises than your promises without your presence. That is a pretty strong declaration. Israel sought God for what he could do while my, Moses sought God for who he is. Their reward was a better lifestyle. Moses's reward was the manifest presence of God. In my experience in ministry and life, I have watched ministers succeed. They've grown large, large churches, yet they're unfulfilled because they were chasing after a large ministry or success. I've seen ministers pursue success and find success and they're satisfied because why? Their satisfaction doesn't come from how large their ministry is. It comes from the presence of God. I've seen ministers that have not had near the success that others have had, yet they walk satisfied. Why? Because their success wasn't how many people were attending my church. Their success was, am I walking with God like Enoch? You know, it doesn't matter how much material possessions you have, how successful you are, the question becomes, what are you pursuing? Because that is what's most important. Believe me, God promises success to his children. And success is deemed on different levels by man's standard, 
but success to God is just our obedience. I mean, I realize that our ministry impacts probably most of the nations in the world. It is what I'm called to do. But I know there are pastors in rural areas that have 300 people in their church and they're caring for them. I realize those pastors will stand on the front lines of heaven because they've done what God has told them to do. If they were to compare themselves by pastors in big, big cities who have 10,000 people in their church, they would see themselves as a failure. They would be, they would be discontent. But you know, these pastors, I've seen them. I've been in their churches in little rural areas. They're so content because they know they're obeying God and they're enjoying his presence. I wanna talk about two different presences of God because we're really at that point in the message where it's important that you understand. There are two different presences that the Bible talks about. First of all is his omnipresence. Now, what is that presence? That is the presence of God that David said, where can I go from your presence? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the highest mountain, you're there. If I make my bed in the lowest valley, you're there. That is the presence of God that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Okay, that's the omnipresence of God. The second one I wanna talk about is the manifest presence of God. This is what Jesus spoke in John chapter 14 when he said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, what does the word manifest mean? It means to bring from the unseen into the seen, the unheard into the heard, the unknown into the known. It is when God reveals himself to our senses, to our mind. That presence is a very real aspect of Christianity. So the question I wanna ask you as we close here, wrap this, this lesson up, is are you looking for a manifestation or are you looking for his manifest presence? Now there's a big, big difference. If you remember, Elijah went to the mountain and God passed by and there was an earthquake. God passed by and there's a tremendous wind that's causing the rocks to bang on each other. God pa passes by again and, and there's a fire. But Elijah isn't looking for any of those because after all of that comes the still small voice. And Elijah wrapped his face in his mantle and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And in essence, Elijah was looking for that intimacy, that manifest presence. You know, I love being in my wife's presence, but what I love the most about being in her presence is our interaction, our communicating with one another. You know, God will manifest himself in powerful ways. And in all my travels, I've seen a, a big tragedy. There have been people that they were touched by God's presence and they manifested by crying or laughing or shaking. And so now they think God is found in the shaking. God is found in the laughing. God is found in the crying. That's not true. God is found when we seek him as a person and when we obey what he tells us to do and he manifests his presence, the manifestation is up to him. We can't look for manifestations hoping that we find God in it. If Elijah would have done that, when the earthquake came, he would have said, there's the Lord God. He did pass by, but Elijah was looking for his intimate presence. This is what Moses chased after. This is what Jesus says is available to every believer. I have sat with pastors. When we went to Vietnam and we preached in Vietnam in 2016, I sat with five of the top pastors of that nation. They had been in jail more, more the past 20 years than they were free. And they were being put in jail for their faith and they were persecuted severely for their faith for their faith. Some, well, I remember one of them had teeth missing. It, it, it's, it's, it's tough. But yet, when I had dinner with those five pastors before the meetings began, the joy that was on their faces was unspeakable. Why? Because they learned how to walk in the presence of God. And that was their reward. So if your reward is blessing, if your reward is the promised land, if your reward is manifestations, then guess what? 
you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be an up and down Christian like the children of Israel. One minute they're praising God, the next minute they're complaining. One minute they're praising God, the next minute they're complaining. But if you want his presence, let me tell you something. God promises us his manifested presence. God promises that we can live in his presence, that he will dwell in us and among us. This is what every believer should pursue, is the presence of the Lord. I hope you have created a real hunger for God's presence. In the next lesson, this is what we're gonna talk about. How do we practically go there? How do we practically enter in and walk in and abide in the presence of God? You don't wanna miss that lesson.